Good afternoon, everybody. If you are a student at Rare Book School, I hope you've had a fantastic day. And even if you're not, actually. Our lecture this evening is made possible by uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we're very grateful to the NEH for their sponsorship of this lecture. They've been great benefactors to Rare Book School and to our bibliographical and book historical enterprise over many years. And without foundations like the NEH and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and IMLS, we just wouldn't be in business in the way that we are today. So um, funding for the humanities is really important. Joe wouldn't be here with us today if we didn't have that funding from the NEH. And I hope that, that all of you will be champions of the humanities and of the funding of the humanities um, down the line, as I'm sure many of you already are. Our distinguished speaker this evening, Joseph Rezik, is Associate Professor of English and Director of the American and New England Studies Program at Boston University. He received his MA from Columbia University and his PhD from UCLA. Professor Rezik is the author of London and the Making of Provincial Literature, Aesthetics and the Transatlantic Book Trade, 1800 to 1850, from the U Penn Press's much vaunted material text series published in 2015. This is a book that has received rave reviews. One reviewer, for example, opined, this excellent book is a must read for scholars of the history of the book in the 19th century, especially for those interested in the Atlantic world. While another opined in even more laudatory terms, Joseph Rezik's London and the Making of Provincial Literature is a landmark achievement in Atlantic literary studies. Rezik's book deserves the widest possible audience and should serve as a reference point for all scholars of Irish, Scottish, and American literature who are interested in the Atlantic world or the history of the book. That is amazing press. Professor Rezik's work has appeared in such publications as Early American Literature, Early American Studies, ELH, that's English Literary History, ALH, American Literary History, Studies in Romanticism, and in the volumes Early African American Print Culture, The Unfinished Book, and the Cambridge University Press Series, African American Literature in Transition. Understandably then, he has held an impressive number of prestigious fellowships from the Huntington, the Newberry, U Penn's McNeil Center, the Library Company, the Catherine Panzer Fellowship in the British Book Trades from the Bibliographical Society of America, and most recently an NEH Fellowship to the American Antiquarian Society. His second book, The Radicalization of Print, is under contract with the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and the University of North Carolina Press. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joseph Rezik. Hi everyone, it's great to see you. I know it's been a super long day. Thank you, Michael, for that gracious introduction. It's always so embarrassing to hear all those things. Um, I attended uh, some classes this morning and I really loved it and I wish I could stay all week. Um, I was at Scott, Casper, and Jeff Groves American Book History uh, seminars and it was really fabulous. And I just love Rare Book School and what they do here. I wanna thank first uh, Michael Suarez and the Rare Book School for inviting me to give this lecture. It is an extreme honor and I'm cognizant of that. Um, to be visiting you in this way. I also want to like, thank Laura Item for all of her work coordinating and emailing me and getting everything together for this 
talk. I'm truly honored. OK, I'll just jump in. I don't have to remind this audience that one of the most influential statements about the importance of print in the early modern period comes from Francis Bacon, writing in 1620. It helps to notice the force, power, and consequences of discoveries which appear at their clearest in three things that were unknown to antiquity, and whose origins, though recent, are obscure and unsung, namely the art of printing, gunpowder, and the nautical compass. In fact, these three things have changed the face and condition of things all over the globe. The first in literature, the second in the art of war, the third in navigation. Elizabeth Eisenstein used these famous remarks from Novum Organum as an epigraph to the 1968 essay that grew into her field-defining work, The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, from 1979. Eisenstein took her cue from Bacon and attempted to confirm his claim about the radical cultural changes affected by the advent of printing, although she had less to say about war and global exploration. As it happens, this passage in Novum Organum is immediately preceded by an equally fascinating passage Eisenstein left out, a comparison between the mechanical arts of Europe and the supposed absence of such arts in the Americas. Let anyone reflect how great is the difference between the life of men in any of the most civilized provinces of Europe and in the most savage and barbarous region of New India, and he will judge that they differ so much that deservedly it may be said that man is a god to man, not only for help and benefit, but also in the contrast between their conditions. And this is due not to soil, climate, or bodily qualities, but to arts. Bacon, of course, assumes these modern discoveries were made in Europe, which is not true. It's a myth that persists to this day. More importantly, with this comparison, Bacon makes his definition of European civilization dependent on a contrast with barbarous regions in America that lack arts like printing. I would never blame Eisenstein for omitting this prelude to Bacon's more well-known passage. Her concern was Europe, after all, and not America. In this talk and in my work more broadly, however, I'm concerned with both, and particularly the binary Bacon sets up between them. Contrasts like Bacon's worked to, de to define the art of printing as inherently, not accidentally, European. This happens through the geographical scale of his comparative method, which remains central to the idea that the medium, along with its brother discoveries, changed the face and condition of things all over the globe. This process of Europeanizing print is ideological, and it was powerful and lasting in the early modern period. It is an important precondition for what I've called in a 2020 essay, the racialization of print, which I would define as the centuries-long, non-inevitable procedure through which printed objects became powerfully associated with white supremacy and ideologies of racial hierarchy. That's the process and subject of the book I'm currently writing. And my talk today about Richard Hacklett and John Smith is drawn from the first chapter. Bacon's insistence that arts and not inherent bodily qualities are responsible for the contrast between civilization and barbarism suggests he wrote at a time when con concepts of modern racial difference had begun to emerge but were not yet solidified. So I'm going to give you a kind of an overview of this book, because I think it's important to see why I'm beginning where I am and then where the book goes. So my work on the racialization of print seeks to provide a new genealogy of the distinctively modern idea that a printed book, a single book, can index the nature of a race. What can a book reveal about the racial group to which its author belongs? Many people in the early modern, people at, early modern period asked. What conditions are necessary for such a question even to make sense? And how did the, such conditions arise? My book begins in the early modern period with the spread of printing in Europe and the emergence of modern racial categories, and it ends in the mid-19th century with the industrialization of print and the codification of scientific racism. I argue that it was only after the age of revolution, the age Phyllis Wheatley, that readers came to believe a printed book provides a special kind of racial knowledge. And Wheatley is the central figure of my book. 
In the 19th century, I go on to argue after Wheatley, this indexical logic was strategically embraced by many black and Native American authors who published texts explicitly to forward the cause of racial justice. And we are in the house of Jefferson, and I know that you're probably sick of hearing about him at UVA, and you know, here I'm coming from Boston. Okay, so it's Thomas Jefferson's assessment of Phyllis Wheatley in query 14 of Notes on the State of Virginia, um, where his racist depiction of her as her poetry as below the dignity of criticism, right? That is sort of at the heart of the questions that interest me. Jefferson picked up this book and he thought, okay, I've got a book by an enslaved black woman. It's gonna tell me something about all African people, right? Um, how did Jefferson think that that leap of logic was even possible, right? The associations bound up in the codex and the fancy metropolitan codex in particular, um, how did those sets of assumptions come to be, right? And so in my book, I go back to the early modern period to figure out a series of processes that led to something, someone like Jefferson believing that. Okay, so the earliest part of this long process, which is the subject of my talk today, I call the establishment phase of Prince racialization, during which the hyper elite medium of the printed codex slowly acquired an association with white authorship. My work on Hacklett and Smith comprises the first chronological episode of that larger story, writing as they did before whiteness as a racial category emerged in the late 17th century, and I'm prepared to talk about that chronology uh, later. The earliest Anglophone literature of travel and colonization can help us understand the relationship between early modern ideologies of human variety, which is sort of what they called race, and ideologies associated with print authorship. I want to suggest that print authorship became presumptively European as authors repeatedly contrasted their own identities with non-European, non-Christian people they cast only as objects in Prince's field of representation. Through focusing on two monumental codices of this period, both folios, Hacklett's The Principal Navigations, Voyages, Traffics, and Discoveries of the English Nation, published in 1598 to 1600 in three volumes, and John Smith's The General History of Virginia, New England and the Summer Isles, published in 1624, I shall show how complicated and varied the Europeanization of print was in the Anglophone context. Since Elizabeth Eisenstein made her arguments on behalf of Francis Bacon, which she did very effectively, although as you know, there's much debate about that, no scholar working on these questions has been more important than Walter Mignolo. In the darker side of the Renaissance, he considered the clash between Spanish and Amerindian societies in the 16th century to argue that the printed book became a medium associated with European colonial ambition. According to Mignolo, Western ideologies of literacy and history that printed books came to symbolize, ideologies long associated with the bright cultural advances of the Renaissance, were responsible for the much darker process of colonization itself. My work here begins with Mignolo's fundamental insight about the kind of metropolitan authority printed books embodied. And here's Mignolo. During the process of colonization, the book was conceived by Spaniards as a container in, with, in which knowledge from the new world could be deposited, as a carrier by means of which signs could be transmitted to the metropolis, and finally as a text in, with, in which truth could be discerned from falsehood the law imposed of chaos. Hacklett and Smith also conceived of printed books as objects that could sort out truth and law from falsehood and chaos. To identify how a medium acquires its ideologies, however, I think we need to focus on process even more than Mignolo does. He argues that the Spanish imported a European ideology of the book to the new world that was ultimately imposed upon Amerindian ways of record keeping but he leaves little room for the idea that a colonizer's conception of what a book could mean could itself have been shaped and reshaped by violent encounter and conquest. I'll be suggesting today on a granular level that print authorship became meaningfully European through the process of such encounters and their mediations. And the word process, I think, is the key thing I want you to keep in your head as I talk about Hacklin and Smith. Okay, we're here in Virginia, and I'm going to talk more about John Smith than Richard Hacklin. So the Hacklin people, I have talked to you about Hacklin. I'll talk more about him. Um, he'll be a stage, he'll be sort of like a prelude to the John Smith section. 
Um, and I'll be arguing ultimately that the key to understanding Smith is revealed in really interesting revisions he made to early writings for their inclusion in the general history. Um, the folio book he hoped would monumentalize his achievements as a columnist. Okay, but first, here's Hacklet. So this is the three volume uh, Principal Navigations. This is the copy of the John Carter Brown Library, which has this gorgeous John Carter Brown binding um, at it. Um, and I'll just sort of, there's not a great portrait of Hacklet, so this will stand in for him, um, which makes a certain amount of sense because the book was so monumental. For those of you who don't know anything about Richard Hacklet, he became one of the most important Elizabethan era propagandists for North American colonization through direct advocacy at court. He wrote briefs for Queen Elizabeth about colonization and the publication of several influential printed books. For the three volume Principal Navigations, which was an expansion, a culmination of a career of doing this, he gathered and reprinted hundreds of travel narratives from the medieval period to the present that covered English travelers' experiences all over the world, in Africa, the Mideast, the Far East, Russia, Lapland, and especially the Americas. The third volume here, the largest volume, is about the Americas. Hacklet's book included dozens of important narratives that would become famous, including Thomas Harriet's 1588 report about Roanoke, Sir Walter Raleigh's attempt to find El Dorado, John Hawkins' several travels to Africa, Martin Frobisher's search for the Northwest Passage, and global circumnavigation narratives by Francis Drake and Thomas Cavendish. Principal Navigations enshrined and disseminated exoticized depictions of non-European people and their ways of life, describing, described with widely varying attitudes. There's a great heterogeneity in how people are described here, but always with the moral, religious, and cultural judgments of Western European perspectives. So long recognized by historians like David Armitage and Peter Moncal as a nationalist Protestant project, Principal Navigations offered English readers stories about their nation's history of foreign exploration and also attempted to establish the superiority and internal coherence of Christendom. Jennifer L. Morgan has argued that books like Hacklet's, quote, erected a boundary that made English expansion in the face of confused and uncivilized peoples reasonable, profitable, and moral. Cultural historians since, since Winthrop Jordan and Kim F. Hall have used sources from Hacklet to explore early, early modern racial ideology. For anyone interested in race in the early modern period, everyone's citing narratives from Hacklet. Okay, I'm just gonna suggest briefly that the objectifying rhetoric of the voyages haunts Hacklet's own self-representation as the creator of the Codex. In the opening preface to the 1598 volume, Hacklet uses the language of the body to describe the process of reading, searching, compiling, editing, and publication. Quote, what restless nights, what painful days, he writes, what heat, what cold have I endured? How many long and chargeable journeys have I traveled? This is the scholar, right? So he's complaining, which is what we all do, but the, he's, he's complaining in a fascinating way. He goes on. Um, recompense for his body's wreckage, this wrecked him, appears to lie in his creation of another body, the book itself. To further describe his labor, Hacklet draws on well-worn tropes that analogize books to bodies, and he casts the republication of lost texts as illumination and resurrection. Having for the benefit and honor of my country, this is the passage, zealously bestowed so many years, so much travail and cost, to bring antiquities smothered and buried in dark silence to light, and to preserve certain memorable exploits of late years by our English nation achieved from the greedy and devouring jaws of oblivion, to gather likewise and as it were to incorporate into one body the torn and scattered limbs of our ancient and late navigations by sea, our voyages by land, and traffics of merchandise by both, and having so much as in me lieth restored, each particular member being before displaced to their true joints and ligaments, I presume to offer unto thy view this first part of my threefold discourse. And he's Dr. Frankenstein, okay? He's taking the scattered limbs of the stories of English voyagers and shoving them together into this body. Okay, this description weaves together discourses of embodiment, dismemberment, and restoration to create a quasi-theological process. England is imagined as both timeless 
ancient and late, and vulnerable to the greedy and devouring jaws of oblivion. Hacklett casts his actions not as creative, exactly, but restorative. Alluding to Christian doctrines of the resurrection of the body, Hacklett gathers, reincorporates, and reorganizes into one body several pieces that had been lost to darkness. As uh, Leah Whittington has written, many Renaissance editors, quote, trumpeted their bibliographic and philological activities as miracles of resuscitation. Editing, she goes on to say, was the process of repairing wounds, of rehabilitating damaged limbs, and restoring the whole textual body to its pristine, uninjured condition. In Hacklett's case, the image of him reattaching the scattered limbs of lost texts to their true joints and ligaments presupposes a previously existing corporate body of national triumphs and voyaging, even though the fabrication of such a body is so obviously the explicit project of principal navigations itself. Okay, Hacklett's embodied metaphor of the book resonates throughout principal navigations in numerous scenes of bodily destruction that occur seemingly without discrimination all over the globe. And this is my modern eight volume edition of Hacklett that I got on Abe Books. A beautiful 1964 reprint of the 1907 triumphant uh, British Empire edition. And now I'm just gonna describe a whole bunch of violence that actually he narrates, that different voyages narrate in the book. Okay, foreign voyaging, if you read Hacklett, always comes with the risk of violent death. Countless individuals in the voyages succumb to starvation, battle, plague, infection, poisoned arrows, shipwreck, piracy, torture, fire, flood, slaughter, beheading, evisceration, all at the hands of, in this language, infidels, heathens, savages, Indians, Negroes, or Christian enemies, especially the Spanish. I'll give you some examples. Francis Drake, in his 1585 voyage, condemns the Spanish colonists in Santiago, Cape Verde, for mutilating the corpse of a young English sailor. Quote, the rude manner of killing and savage kind of handling of the dead body of one of our boys, found by them straggling all alone, from whom they had taken his head and heart and had straggled the other bowels about the place in the most brutish and beastly manner. Loris Chemis's 1598 narrative describes cannibals in Guiana. These speak the language of the Indians of Dominica. They are but few, but very cruel to their enemies, for they bind and eat them alive piecemeal. John Hawkins reported from Guinea in 1564 that hundreds of Africans attacked his men by the shore, quote, shooting at them in the boats and cutting them into pieces, which were drowned in the water. George Peckham, writing about Humphrey Gilbert's 1583 voyage to Newfoundland, spreads rumors about cannibals there, quote, a cruel kind of people whose food is man flesh and have teeth like dogs. They pursue their neighbors with ravenous minds to eat their flesh and devour them. Bodily destructions like these in the voyages echo Hacklett's description of the scattered limbs of England's navigatory records torn by the greedy and devouring jaws of oblivion. There's so much to say here, but my point is to suggest that principal navigations juxtaposes the violence of global voyaging in non-European lands with the restorative balm of Hacklett's activities as a metropolitan compiler and editor. With such juxtaposition, it yokes them together. Hacklett's process of assembling distant voyages into a new body, the Codex, grounds his identity as a European editor and author wishing to address the world as a whole. With so many bodies and records lost to darkness, Hacklett uses print to bring them back to life and into the light. Okay, on to John Smith. Published a quarter century after Principal Navigations, and in the wake of Francis Bacon's Novum Organum, John Smith, The General History of Virginia, aimed to provide a lasting full-length history of Jamestown. These books are connected in all sorts of ways. Uh, John Smith reprints excerpts from Hacklett's Voyages in the first book of The General History to give an account of the region um, that he's talking about. While Hacklett had global representational ambitions, Smith wrote mostly a local story but both examples reveal the process through which print, print authorship gathered European associations. Okay, the Virginia section of general history covers now familiar to many people episodes occurring in the region around the Jamestown settlement. 
beginning with the arrival of Smith and other settlers in 1607. Many historians believe Smith brought a copy of Principal Navigations with him to Jamestown as kind of a manual for dealing with the region. Although Smith himself returned to England in 1609, the history narrates events in Senacomico, which is the Algonquin name for the region, up through the beginning of the Second Anglo-Powhatan War after a native attack that killed a quarter of the English population in Jamestown in 1622. And I mentioned this attack because Smith began work on the general history in London immediately after that native attack on the settlement, after the Virginia Company refused to let him return to avenge the colonists. So, so Smith is frustrated. He wants to go back to Virginia. He wants to bring 100 men to avenge the colonists. The Virginia Company says, no, you're, you're a horrible leader. We don't want you anywhere near Virginia. And so instead, he says, OK, I'm going to write a general history of the area. Right. Um, so the book can be seen as a direct response to this frustration, um, to the violence of native resistance. And in response, he developed a series of tortured authorial strategies as his ambition to become a writer replaced or displaced his plans to colonize. And if you know Smith, you know he wrote many books before general history, but this is the biggest book and the most lasting book um, that he wrote. And it sort of transforms him into this figure, this authorial figure who's an authority too. Okay, truly the most fascinating and understudied aspects of Smith's authorial process are additions and changes that distinguish general history from its source texts. I'm gonna do a little textual history here. For the story of his own time in Jamestown, for this book, he drew upon a book that was published in 1612 with two texts, a map of Virginia and the proceedings of the English colony. The proceedings is the source for book three of the general history, which is the most famous section. Book three of general history is when John Smith is himself in Senecomico, um, and when he is held captive under Poetan, and when Pocahontas saves his life. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about that scene a lot. Um, that's what he says happened, I'll get into that. Okay, when Smith refashioned the earlier text, he expanded it by about 30%. The scale and substance of Smith's expansion for general history matches the shift in format from an ephemeral quarto to an elegant folio meant to last. And here are the two texts at the John Carter Brown Library, um, the 1612 Proceedings, which is a quarto format, um, and which historians have called an occasional book. It was meant to justify his role in Jamestown. And then the General History of Virginia opens to book three here, which is in the folio format. Um, and I'm going to be calling uh, the two texts following editors of Shakespeare, the quarto and the folio. But I just want to tell you, nobody in Smith studies does that. <laughs> um, they're not interested in format. They're interested in what he's, the story he's telling and whether it's true or not. But for me, of course, as a book historian, the format matters, right? Um, so this, he's, he's revising for the folio. He's revising for the permanent account. And I'll be emphasizing two things, his masculine self-presentation as a soldier, and his use of Pocahontas to establish authority along the axis of gender. I should say too, the historiography on Smith is totally vast. I've especially depended on people like Philip Barber, Everett Emerson, Kathleen Brown, Karen Kupperman um, to discuss his revisions. Everyone knows that Smith added, um, everyone in Smith studies and in literature knows that Smith added the scene of Pocahontas' supposed saving him from execution for the general history. Um, it's, he, he sort of invented that in 1624. It's not present in earlier accounts. Historians debate, did it happen or not, right? And, and what historians believe now, and it's pretty certain of this, Smith misunderstood a scene of ritual adoption into Poetan's empire for a scene of execution. So the Poetan Indians would, Poetan threatened to, was, it was sort of a, um, a ritual where he has, has a symbolic death and then gets adopted as a kind of a vassal in Poetan's empire. So Smith misunderstood this as a real threat to his life. So that's really what happened. I'm interested in Smith's process of changing the story, of changing the story. And the, the standard edition of Smith by Philip Barber, which is a Amahandra book from the 80s, um, was edited for historians. And so it does not have a full um, textual apparatus. There's not a list of variants there's not a list of substantive changes in the back that you would have if you had edited Smith according to MLA standards. Um, and so Barber is very good at noting very big changes to 
the quarto for the folio. But he's not good at noting very minor changes. And so when I collated these texts in, in the early English online facsimiles in my office, I wasn't going to do it in the library, um, there are just dozens or scores of single word substitutions of changing in sentences that are unrecorded in the standard edition and that a lot of the historians don't really care about because they want to know what happened. Okay, but I'm interested in Smith's process of revision. Okay, that planned aside was a little longer than I, than, I, than I thought it would be, but thank you for agreeing with me. Okay. Okay, so let's get into the revisions a little bit. Smith uh, clearly used folio publication to burnish the status of Captain Smith as a hero. The folio is a more bloody and violent text. Indigenous enemies everywhere in the folio are more savage, menacing, dehumanized, while English settlers are seen more often as valiant and brave. In one representative edition, Smith elaborates the story of how trade began with a local Indian group. In the Cordo, relations are established quickly and peacefully. Not so in the folio, where Smith let fly his muskets among them, after which 60 or 70 of them, some black, some red, some white, some partly colored, came in square order, singing and dancing out of the woods with their oki, which was an idol, made of skins stuffed with moss, all painted and hung with chains and copper born before them. And in this manner, being well armed with clubs, targets, bows and arrows, they charged the English that so kindly received them with their muskets loaded with pistol shot, that down fell their guard, and diverse lay sprawling on the ground. The rest fled again into the woods, and ere long sent one of their quiaconsots to offer peace, like a priest, and redeem their oki. Smith told them if only six of them would have come unarmed and load his boat, he would not only be their friend, but restore them their oki. This is all new for the folio. Given the importance of religious difference, as justification for colonization, this new passage raises the symbolic stakes of the scene with the appearance, damage, and restoration of the native idol. The introduction of violence makes the encounter a Baconian contrast pitting clubs, targets, bows, and arrows against muskets loaded with pistol shot, gunpowder. In the Cordo, Smith and his indigenous neighbors merely discoursed kindly and traded. In the Folio, such relations are mediated through violence and are only possible once Smith damages and restores their idol. So Smith made many revisions, many more than I can discuss, and this is sort of my notes from my collation. I'll just name a few here. He added a new episode about using a table book to communicate with fellow Englishmen, which emphasizes European control over technologies of writing. He expanded another truly Baconian passage where he amazes Native Americans with the technology of his compass. So we do have a compass, gunpowder, um, and the printing here. And he, substitute, he substitutes the word colony in a few instances for less politicized descriptions of the settlement. So he's inserting the language of colonization into the folio. And almost laughably, in one case, he increases the number of native opponents during a battle. In the Cordo, there's only three or 400, and in the Folio, it's three or 4,000. And there's no way to verify any of these claims. He just decided, as the Folio, I'm gonna have more people to kill. So it's like, it's, it's, it, I'm laughing when I'm doing this collation because of all the exaggerations. He adds a minor injury that didn't hurt that much. Anyway. Okay, so the most famous edition Smith made illustrate the importance of gender in shaping his authorial persona, as I've said. These editions tell the story of his captivity in 1607 and how Pocahontas supposedly saved his life. This is the Robert Vaughn engraving from the General History of Virginia that illustrates this very famous scene. In the Cordo, his imprisonment, and this episode lasts about half a page, for the folio, Smith added 2,000 words. He depicts himself as steady, manly, and superior, while numerous indigenous religious rites and threats to his life swirl around him. In the execution scene, a potentially emasculating moment, people have talked about this, that like, what, he's giving Pocahontas all this power, Smith dramatizes her power to grant clemency. And here's the passage. Having feasted after him, their best barbarous manner they could, a long consultation was held. But the conclusion was, two great stones were brought before Poetin. Then as many as could laid hands on him, dragged him to them, and thereon laid his head, and being ready with their clubs to beat out his brains, Pocahontas, the king's dearest daughter, with no entreaty could prevail, 
got his head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save him from death, whereat the emperor was contented he should live. The noise and numbers of the opening phrases here reinforce Smith's centrality, right, with the barbarous manner and many hands of the natives surrounding him as the solitary Christian subject. In contrast to the two great stones and blunt clubs that will bash Smith's brains, remember he was never under threat of death here, right, he misunderstood what was happening, Pocahontas is strikingly feminized, even for Smith. She's the king's dearest daughter, filled with entreaty and armed only with her embrace. She gathers his head in her arms and bows hers toward him in a motherly gesture, and his masculine persona at this moment depends wholly on the performance of Pocahontas' femininity. So textual revisions and additions elsewhere work with this passage. So there's a section, the big section he added, um, and then there's like little changes everywhere else. Um, they work with this passage to establish Pocahontas as the self-sacrificing heroine of Smith's epic. And this is just one example on my list here. Uh, not long after this episode, when Smith has become president of the colony, he records uh, in the Cordo a scene where 30 young women came naked out of the woods to dance before him and his men. For the folio, he added a protagonist. It is now Pocahontas and her women who entertain Captain Smith. And to make that scene more relaxing and pleasurable for the Englishman, Pocahontas ensures the safety of them by offering her own life as a guarantee. So she does this multiple times. Presently, Pocahontas came, Smith writes newly in the folio, willing him to kill her if any hurt was intended. So the new romance of Pocahontas' devotion to Smith depends on her willingness to put herself on the edge of death. Through risking her life, this new character in the folio anoints the great men around her as superior in stature, strength, and humanity. So many scholars and most readers have understood the execution scene as a gendered allegory for colonization, right? That's why it's a myth. As a native woman enthralled to an Englishman, Pocahontas is meant to represent all indigenous Americans and their preference for European Christian civilization. Okay, as a final point today, which will take me a few more minutes, I wish to suggest that this scene, this exact scene, is also an allegory for the authorial posture Smith wished, wished to establish. And this will depend for a minute looking at his opening paratexts. So to fund the publication of general history and granted legitimacy, Smith secured the, patron, the patronage of the Duchess of Richmond and Lennox, and there's her portrait in the front of the book. In the book's dedication to her, Smith enlists gender as an essential feature of his writerly persona by enumerating a list of women from around the globe who have protected him from perils greater than authorship. And Smith had had many adventures at this point in Turkey and Morocco, and there's always some fancy lady who saves him, right? This is like a chivalric trope, okay? Um, but he's doing it here in the beginning of the general history. And here's the passage that's relevant. Heretofore, honorable and virtuous ladies, and comparable but amongst themselves, have offered me rescue and protection in my greatest dangers. Even in foreign parts, I have felt relief from that sex. In the utmost of many extremities, that blessed Pocahontas, the great king's daughter of Virginia, oft saved my life. And so verily, these my adventures have tasted the same influence from your gracious hand, which hath given birth to the publication of this narrative. And he's so... Um, odious, these gendered metaphors, but there he goes. Okay, so if the Duchess is the book's aristocratic patron in England, Pocahontas, the daughter of a king, acts as Smith's aristocratic patron in Virginia. Her gesture in the execution scene harnesses her father's power and bestows it upon Smith. Through offering her protection and rejecting her father's will, she supports Smith's transformation as an author, just like the Duchess of Richmond and Lennox does. This gesture of self-sacrifice promotes and legitimizes Smith's voice. He lives to tell his story on his own terms and with the permanence the folio format affords. The allegory of colonization, is what I'm saying, both depends upon and reinforces the allegory of print authorship. So the engravings for the general history support this reading of the execution scene. The Duchess of Richmond and Pocahontas are connected by the presence of two parallel and materially equivalent engraved portraits, with the latter now fully assimilated to English culture as Rebecca, the wife of John Rolfe. And Pocahontas, of course, married John Rolfe, and she had her, um, her Algonquin name here, Matoka, is on the portrait. And the image that we've seen already of the execution scene is actually a revision of an earlier image from 
from the Cordo. And, on, and here you see on the left, this is the image from 1812 in the Cordo, and on the right, um, you see the image in the folio. And all of these, the iconography is totally stolen from Theodore Debris' um, um, America series. And Rachel Winchcombe has a great essay about the appropriations of Debris for the general history, but I'll, I don't have time to talk about that. Okay, I'm gonna describe this image. It'll take me about three more minutes. Okay, in the foreground of Vaughn's engraving, Smith lies prostrate, face up, with his head on his block. Two natives hold up clubs, almost sickle-like weapons, ready to strike. Smith's hat has been tossed off to the left at the feet of a row of observers. Powhatan looms in the background next to a giant fire. In the absolute foreground, with her knee merging into the picture's thin black frame, Pocahontas faces away from us with her head bowed and her hand on Smith's chest. Smith's face is visible. Pocahontas demurs modestly from the reader. Smith's body is exposed and vulnerable, but he retains control. Pocahontas blesses his body with prayer, and she denies herself in order to validate Smith's life and story. In many ways, Pocahontas interrupts a danse macabre. The menacing, half-naked, skeletal-like figures encircling Smith foretell his death, mocking the vanity of his human wishes. The scene recalls one of the most famous illustrations of the danse macabre, the oldest surviving depiction of a European printing shop. And many of you know this picture. Matthias Huss's 1499 image was imitated and adapted many times in the ensuing two centuries. Striking visual rhymes connect the scene in the printing shop with the execution scene. The tall native figures in the background of the Smith tableau resemble the giant skeletons in the print shop and the ink beater with his raised hand behind the printing press. Smith's head rests on a block, ready to be permanently imprinted with the heavy clubs of his executioners. The Powhatan Indians, with head and shoulders painted red, are like so many printer's devils, covered with ink. Pocahontas saves Smith by pressing her hand upon his chest, joining his own arm in a gentle parallel. A scene of destruction, Smith's death, becomes instead a scene of publication that Pocahontas has personally arranged for us. We read Smith's open, legible, exposed face as we would a narrative on paper. Richard Hacklett used print to fight death. Publication was a kind of resurrection. The same dynamics are at work in the allegory Smith wished to enshrine in general history. Smith gave Pocahontas a wholly new starring role in the folio. He harnessed and appropriated Pocahontas as a character to authorize and dramatize his exploits in Virginia. Thank you very much. And I'm, I, can, I can do questions? Yeah, sure. And I think there's a, mic, there's a, a microphone for people who have questions. Go ahead. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about the questions which are kind of interrelated. Um, can you talk a bit about, you talked about the really racialization of print in this anglophone context. Can you talk about how Hacklock represents Chinese printing, which of course preceded printing in the West, and on a related note, could you talk about basically the, um, the nature of this work more generally? How do you avoid replicating the white gaze and the product, the product um, of that gaze in your own work studying it um, and acknowledge the other you know, aspects of the bookmaking that did go on in these communities? Great. Yes. Yeah, so Hacklett does. Hacklett was really fascinated by printing in China, and he has and he has a lot of letters in, in the, that he reprints in Principal Navigations. Please, when you're in, you know, can take give me any indication of examples from printing in, in China and Korea and the Far East, right? So he's 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 cognizant of the existence of printing in other places besides besides Europe for sure. Am I? I don't know what happened. Use both. Okay. Um, so the, ba the Baconian kind of line about you know these are these are European arts was Hacklett himself understood there was printing elsewhere in the world. Um, I think though he he understood print certainly as as an as an instrument of of English colonial 
um, endeavors. And that was like one reason why he was so obsessed with providing evidence for a long history in voyaging and in, and in, and in traffic. Um, as far so I don't have much more to say about that besides that he was fascinated with all different kinds of books and printing from around the world. And as far as the danger of reproducing the... Do you mean the, da the danger of reproducing the white gaze? I mean, I think I'm, I'm fascinated in this early, in the early modern stuff um, about emphasizing the, the really close tie between, between print and colonization and how print was so central and Smith is bringing Hacklett to Virginia with him and that was... Their, their intertwined um, efforts. And really the whole, the whole point of this is to set up um, a, a notion of European authorship and of white authorship that becomes really solidified in the 17th century going into the 18th century um, that sort of helps ideologies of racial difference also solidify. And then you have racial hierarchies by the end of the 17th century and the 18th century. And then, you know, I try to, that's sort of where the project is going. And I, I, guess, I guess sort of like in this early, the early stages of it, um, it's, it's, it's about the, the white authors doing it. And then as, as these ideologies solidify in the 18th century, we get to people like Phyllis Wheatley, Samson Ockham, the Mohican minister, and other people in the 19th century who really, who are, who are forced to deal with a medium that had been long associated with and intertwined with racial hierarchy and ideologies of white supremacy. And they use print then in their own way to upend those hierarchies. Um, but in the early, the early period, I'm interested in, in how these white authors, these productively white authors, are using print to advance European superiority. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm careful to have this, this not be an account of Senakomoko or, or Mutoka or Wenzahenakak, the, who's the Poetan's um, real name in Algonquin, because I'm interested in the way these representations are, are working. Does that make sense? Over here and then over there. Thank you so much. Uh, this is fabulous talk and really fascinating. I'm really struck by the parallel you're making between the patron of publication and you know, the process of that femininity and these metaphors of you know, the mother, midwife, whatever the text. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, though, um, do you talk a little bit about how that sort of extreme femininity performance out of the Pocahontas character, does that in some way deny any exploration of even you know, this limited sense of racial difference? Um, or is there a space for like an intersection of identity for women and um, Yeah, so certainly her, her yes, yeah, so the, um, I did make an analogy between these two figures, right? The, the, the British aristocratic patron and then who I called the uh, Pocahontas as a native aristocrat. Yeah, so obviously, you know, she's, she's racialized here. She's darkened in the picture, even though she's in, dressed in Jacobean clothing. I mean, so I think that there's absolutely central to his depiction of Pocahontas is her status as um, a native woman and as a non-Christian, although she converts to Christianity. Um, what honestly, though, what interests me about it is just that that he's drawing he's drawing these analogies with these aristocratic women, and they and, and in his in his in the in the dedication between the Duchess and Pocahontas, and there's a lady in Turkey who helps him, and she's a lady, she's an aristocrat. So I think that there's like a and there's there's the noble woman, which is a chivalric trope that he's yoking he's yoking them all together. I'm not going to give Smith any credit for like making these women equal to each other because of racial difference and all kinds of cultural and religious differences. Um, but he's still he's still he's still doing it in that way, and he's he's flattening he's flattening out um, on the basis of gender. He's flattening out their their, their cultural differences. Um, so that is that is why I think the, the analogy is compelling, and why I think Pocahontas is a figure for his for a, a patron for him in terms of authorship. Um, but certainly her her um, her cultural and racial identity is massively important for him. And the, the, the importance of Pocahontas in general in England is another totally fascinating subject. But again, I'm, I'm interested in why does he, he creates this new character for the folio. And he, he really, um, and that has been discussed like a lot, but some of the minor things that are different, and certainly this business about it being about the printing shop is totally bananas in my view, even though I really like that reading. But it's like, I think that that's an important, important aspect of what's happening here. There's a question over here and then in the back. Uh, it's a wonderful talk, Joe. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
many questions, but I'll just limit it to one I hope or one plus. Um, which is, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, if and how you triangulate um, the, uh, the issue of morality um, alongside your interest in what you're calling the racialization of the print. Um, and I'm thinking here specifically of um, very troubling comments made by one of Walter Hahn, you know, who, you know, who makes claims about the primacy um, of, of really great textuality um, over oral cultures. In, and, and because you're writing about these encounters right, between the so whole world, you know, so the new world, you know, how do we understand um, the kind, not just the, the racialization of print, but also of morality and 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 morality, sorry, textuality when we get these encounters between uh, Europeans and indigenous cultures? Yes, that's a great question, and I think that in the um, a lot of people have written about Smith's appropriation of speeches by Poetan um, and his recording of them, and the kind of like. Um, and there's all these dialogues and speeches, and of course Jefferson was fascinated by recording speeches of Native Americans, and there's this, this giant amount of objectification happening um, and appropriation and use in print and mediation of those scenes of morality. Um, and I think that's intensely problematic just in itself, um, but I'm, I'm interested in this early period about the way that print can harness and control those, harness and control orality um, into, into the medium of print. Um, I think there's a, you know, and I've, I've written a little bit about 19th century orality and, and sermons and printed texts and stuff, and I think there's a danger in, in focusing on, uh, you know, oh, there's this obviously not a binary between orality and print. They're working together. You know, there's reading out loud. There's, you know, orality. Then there's speeches that are then going with the other, speeches made with the understanding that will be printed. Um, so there's not, there's not a sense of it being, they're being totally opposed uh, way, modes of expression, I don't think. Um, but in this project, I really am interested in the, the book as a format and, in, and, and, and what that kind of encounter can mean um, for, for, cultural, for cultural understandings, right? And you know, in the, in the class this morning with, with Scott and Jeff, we talked about um, Ruben's essay, what is the history and history of books? And one thing she says is, you know, one way to look at what, what is the cultural value of books in a society. And that, and that for me, it's this, when, when print becomes, when books become racialized, when the codex gathers this meaning that you think you can understand, as Jefferson did, a whole race of people based on an encounter with an object. Um, that is the ideology that, that's striking to me. And orality is, is, a, is sort of, in my, my search to understand that ideology, orality is sort of related to it, but not a major part of what I'm trying to figure out. Um, printed texts are infused with orality. Poetry is oral form in print, right? Um, so that's part of it, but it's the, it's the encounter with the object for me that I find particularly interesting. That's really exciting. Um, I'm really impressed with what's going on here. Um, you're putting a lot of the agency in printing the hands of John Smith. I'm wondering how that's affected with what's going on with the shows and printing at the time. Because when I think about Hackler, I know that Hackler has been in book printers, has been recorded in discoveries, has this long print history which is associated with um, the copy held by him. So, how does the right to reprint the original Fulton version, which is in the hands of John Cat, pass in the hands of Michael Sparks? How is John Smith mediating this problem? What how does it interface with, with the copyright or the pre copyright copy vision of the station? So that, that's a great question about how to, you know, what is what is the the, the copyright or or implications, the ownership implications of, um, and is this the last question? Is that 
the, okay, great. What, what are the, when Smith is revising the, the Cordo, like what are the ownership implications or property implications? I actually don't know the details of um, of how if Smith sought permission for the eighteen for the sixteen twelve Cordo. It's just that all of the people who who have studied the question of Smith's expansion for the folio talk about him having the. 1612 proceedings next to him, and he's making all these changes. And it's obvious when you do a collation that that's exactly what's happening because there's, there's, there's you know, um, all these tiny words are changed, and then there's passages added and everything. But I don't know if there, there's not this business of you know Hacklin and his successors and passing down manuscripts and all of that with Smith. Although there, with Smith doing the, the general history of Virginia, he clearly had access to many other manuscript sources that he's incorporating in there too. And the different books of the general history are drawing on different textual sources, some of them manuscript, some of them printed, um, some of them from Hacklet. So there's clearly like a compiling happening from him. And I am kind of giving him a lot of the agency here just because that's sort of how other scholars have talked about the way this text was, was compiled. But there probably were lots of other mediating people um, who are providing, you know, textual objects, permissions, um, or other kinds of information to him to make the whole thing um, cohere. Yeah. But there's more to be said about that. Sure. There's more to be said about the law. And interesting is that you are most normally invited for reception in Professor Reddick's honor downstairs in the multi-purpose room where we can continue the conversation and indeed but meanwhile, we'd like to, to give you a little token of our gratitude here. <laughs> Thank you. Wow.